we're here to talk about the Thunder and What's up, guys? what we think it's going to take to get into the playoffs, bro. Who is it down to for that 10th spot? Man, th this is going to get crazy because, you know, there's always a team, uh, chance a team just flounders and just goes, yeah, right? Like the Lakers or the Pelicans or whatever. So, you know, keeping that in context with what's going on and, and understanding that we're looking at the bottom section of teams right now. We're looking at 7 through 10 or 7 through 11. And we're trying to figure out which teams we match up best against if it comes down to us only getting a few wins at the end of the season. Right. So... Essentially, with Dallas kind of struggling right now, the fact that we have the tiebreaker on them and they're the most likely team to really make a push to knock us out of that 10th spot, we should kind of essentially look at their schedule really quickly and come away with what we think they need to do to get to the point where they can pass us right now. So who do they have left in their schedule? Yeah, man. On Wednesday, they have the 76ers. And then in uh, April, they have five games, uh, which are Heat, Hawks, Kings, Bulls, and then the last game, which I'm circling personally because I want to watch, is Popovich's last game for the San Antonio Spurs. Um, he's going into retirement. So I'm circling that game as well because that's gonna, not going to be an easy game because you, you're going to see a lot of people, a lot of big-time people come out to see if Popovich can get his last win there. Right, so none of those sound like easy wins. Maybe the easiest no. game is the Bulls, and they're actually playing pretty No, I was going to say right the now. Hawks. The Hawks, I'll say the okay. Hawks is, yeah, I would say the Hawks is going to be the easiest game for them, if that. But here's the thing about where the Mavericks are. They're 3-7 and seven over the last 10, so there are no easy games right now for them, right? Mm -hmm. Each game is really important, and each team can really throw them off just by playing a really good you know, game because the, the Mavericks are struggling. And they're, but they got to win, so now that we're only up, up half a game on them, and let's talk about what we have for our last seven, and then we'll kind of talk about what we think we have to do to hold off the um, the Mavericks. We got the Hornets coming up tonight, then the Pistons yes. immediately coming up right tomorrow night. Pacers, Suns, Warriors, Jazz, and Grizz. So similarly, we have some really tough games, although I think we have some easier games than what the Mavericks have right now. Um, but we, the two easiest games, the Hornets and the Pistons, um, maybe the Pacers, they're, they're all right in a row here, but Two of them are back-to-back, -back. so that immediately takes away a little bit of the advantage of having the easier games. we got to figure out how to win back-to-backs, um, and that's where it's got to start. So I think that we can probably win all three of those. The Suns are going to need a win, right? So we got to tip our hat. The Warriors are going to need a win. So at that point, we could be 3-2. and two. We could also yeah. be 2-3. and three. Never know. Then we have the Jazz and the Grizz, and there's no guarantees right there. But if we can figure out how to get four wins – I, I really think we can hold off the Mavericks almost no matter what they do. Yeah, four wins is the number that I'm circling um, because uh, with four wins, that means in order to pass us that um, Dallas would have to go five and one. Okay. And looking at Dallas's schedule, I don't think they can do that. So four wins is automatic lock in the playoffs, guys. So that's what I'm looking at. Um, I, I do think that we're going to go three and uh, I'm sorry, two and one over the next three games um, because, you know, as much as I want to say that we're going to you know, blow all three teams out of the water, I, I think I want to be optimistic and recognize that Shea's probably not going to play in one of them. You know, He's got a big push the last few games of the season into the playoffs, so Shea probably won't play in, in both of them. So with that being said, is that I want to be optimistic and recognize that there could be a fumble here, and it's okay. It's a fumble. You know, we, we still get the ball back, and the last four games of the season are going to be crucial. So for me, I'm looking at that and saying if we can go uh, two and one here and we're setting ourselves up to have to go – two and two the last four games of the season to me that's the winner right there that's that's what i'm saying is the the, the bee's knees because anything else is just gravy on top so if we're able to get you know six wins mark or if we're able to somehow pull off a, a seven and oh record which would be crazy but we could do uh we could find ourselves into that that seven or six seed so for me it, it's all about what this team can do and and, and really coming to terms that we're tired this team has never been able to um, been pushed this far before. Been, they're the young, second youngest team in history, and the, and the um, concept of the Oklahoma City Thunder, this core is the youngest core up in history. So you got to take that in context. Like, what is too much for this team? Well, we're about to find out. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I'm telling you guys, greatness is discovered when you're put to fire, when you're consistently pounded and pounded and shaped and mold, and then all of a sudden you're able to see what the greatness is. And, and, and Shea's been getting hounded against 
uh, the Trailblazers and the Lakers and the Clippers and the Suns. Man, he's been getting hounded. And guess what? Now he's been shaped and molded. And I think what's going to come out on the other side is something beautiful. And, and we're all going to be able to sit back and watch Shea as he takes his team to the next level. And I think that's the greatest thing about having a, a player like that with Shea. And, and, and knowing that Shea and Dort and, and J-Dub and Giddy and Jay will and JRE, all these guys are about to get some serious playoff minutes. It's, it's truly spectacular thought. Absolutely, dude. And, you know, coming into seven games left and we are looking at, we're in a three-way race, really. We're not mentioning that we're tied with the Lakers right now. Um, and they could really fumble and here also. a game that we're half a game ahead of or behind Pelicans and we're a game right. behind. I mean, it's just, it's crazy how it is. But it's all we're just there. focusing on the minimum that we, you know, could minimum. have to happen. And, but if you just think about the fact that we're really in a three-way race and there's two spots available, right? It's going to be probably the Lakers, the Mavericks, and the Thunder. One of those, two of those three teams, you know, make it to the playoffs. It could, something freaky could happen, but we're kind of doubting it right now. So the race has really crystallized and both of those other teams are led by superstars with one name, you know, that are yeah. known around the world with one name. You got Luca, mm. you got LeBron, and well, we have one too was Shea. Now, not everybody yeah. in the world knows his name yet, but if you could have told anybody, anybody that was a you know basketball expert, that the conclusion of this team or this year would come down to this situation, right? They would say that it was more impressive that Shea found himself in this spot than either one of those people, because both of those guys, they'd be like, well, that's a little bit disappointed that they're fighting just to have their playoff life. But that's the season. And here we are, Shea is emerging and those other guys are sort of seemingly fading. And that's really what we're seeing a power dynamic in the NBA starting to shift in a similar way to when the, the thunder, you know, went toe to toe with the Lakers for six games. That first time, that first generation of great thunder players, all of a sudden everybody stops and they go, okay, this is the team to watch. Yeah. That's, it's the coming out party that I love about, teams like this and we saw it with uh, Memphis a couple of years ago um, and, and Mark and I watched the Memphis team two years ago and we we're like that's going to be the Thunder in two years you know like we knew we knew the Thunder was going to be able to get to that level and the fact is is that we've been saying that you know Shea's better than this player and that player and this player for quite a while now and now when you see the rest of the NBA start recognizing that Shea's season is better than Dame's season is better than you know, what I would consider Steph Curry is having this year. And you can go down the list. It, it, it starts to really put in context to exactly what we've been saying. And all the guys have been listening for all this time have been saying about this team and how we build uh, or how this organization has built this team through, you know, uh, human beings and not basketball players. And I think that's something that's so important that, that Sam Presti will always get up there and talk about at the end of every single year about how he is so impressed about how these guys have as a unit have come together and been able to do things. And it doesn't matter about the wins. It doesn't matter about the losses. What Sam Presti wants to see is this unit as a unit work together. And I, that's what I love. I, I, I keep going back to it over and over again that this team isn't done peaking. And I really hope that we all get an opportunity to see what this team does when, when they flex, when Shays Olsen saying, Hey, I got this guys. I, I, you know what? If I need to put four 40 point games together in order for us to get to the playoffs, I'll do that because I believe he can. Yeah. And that's the thing. If we get it into a playoff series or even to the play in game, like I don't think that we quite know what Shea is capable of. And I'll say the same thing about Josh, because one thing that I've learned from watching him play mm -hmm. is right. that he reminds me a lot of like Manu Ginobili in the fact that he Pretty rises sure. to the moment competitively. And as the tension builds in a building, right? That's when ball fakes work even best, right? And mm. that's when like cutting and, you know, understanding proper passing and getting easy buckets at the key moments start to like really shine. And, you know, when you have all the bright lights there, you know, all of the, everything gets amplified. And when you see a competitor who shines in that type of moment, then all of a sudden people's perspective stops being blinded by their you know inability to perceive what's happening. They start saying, holy shit, if he does this and this and this, and then they get carried away, right? Because in the end, true competitors save their best games for the biggest moments. Man, you're so right. It's called that BDE energy. You know what I'm saying? 
And Josh has got that oozing out of every single pore of his body. And that's what I love about what this team is capable of doing is that you're still starting to see the charisma. You're starting to see the uh, uh, the ability to connect with just a finger mo- motion or an eye um, you know, motion that's all of a sudden, boom, done. Like how many teams in the game have we ever seen that is that are this young, which has been never, and mm-hmm. then also being able to connect on this level? You, you don't see this. I mean, in professional sports, we talk to a lot of people in Australia that talk about footy and and how the cats were all of a sudden, boom, the best team in the league because they did things right. You know, they had a GM that came in and drafted and did all these things right to make this um, the, the, the cats this powerhouse of a team. You know, and we, people are comparing that to the Oklahoma City Thunder because when you when you draft proper, you draft human beings, and you draft these amazing people, and they come in the organization and they change how everything is done, and then also you bring the right coaches in and you bring the right you know assistant GMs to help you um, prolong your time as as a, a playoff contender. Like that's what we're seeing, guys. Mm-hmm. We're seeing this immaculate, incredible, beautiful thing in front of us. And it kind of reminds me of the great story of when Mary got pregnant by the greatest human being of all, right? Boom, Sam Presti and his children. Yo, I, it was also reminding me of another story I'll just share right before we get out of here, bro. It reminds me of the fact that we've had a chance to talk to a lot of the guys that played on the original Dream Team, mm. the 92 Olympic team. One of the guys that we spent a day with was John Stockton. And we had a chance to kind of talk to him a little bit about what it was like to play on the dream team. And he said, the key was the most amazing thing was you'd be out there and you'd think somebody should cut back door right now. And as soon as you would think that there would be Michael Jordan cutting back door, or you'd see Scottie Pippen or any of the one, any of the 50 greatest that were out there doing the exact right thing at the right moment. And he said, the basketball IQ was unreal. Everybody understood what they should be doing, and nobody ever had to tell anybody what to do. And that's, that's what we're kind of seeing start to develop. I know, I know we shouldn't get too carried away dream team comparisons, but we're talking about offensive IQ. And it's starting to develop, and we're seeing the defensive IQ develop, and we're starting to Bam. see a team that reminds us of so much more than just a regular basketball team. So enjoy the fucking ride, everybody. And if you guys want to hear us talking about why we think everything is golden, baby – Tell them what to do, Dave. You push that right there.